Hi, I'm Richard Morris from Canberra, Australia. In 2014, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. After taking the dietary advice of the Australian Diabetes Association, I became more diabetic. <laughs> I did some research, including reading a very important book, The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living, which first defined the term nutritional ketosis. Mm. Spoiler alert, I reversed my type 2 diabetes by drastically reducing my carbohydrate intake and increasing my consumption of healthy fats. In 2016, I was determined to help my buddy Carl by showing him what I did and the science behind it. Hey, y'all, that's me. I'm Carl Franklin from the United States, and I also used to be a type 2 diabetic, but not yep. quite as severely as Richard. No. Nah. I devoured all that info Richard sent me, and after a mutual friend went keto to address prostate cancer, which he is still cancer-free, by the way. Yay! I also went on the ketogenic diet, and that was in February of 2016. By April, I was in full swing, reversing my diabetes. We're not doctors, we don't give medical advice. We're just a couple of dudes on the internet who reverse their diabetes by following a ketogenic diet. Right, we just want to share our experiences and what we know about the science behind the ketogenic diet. Yeah, so we started this podcast to chronicle Carl's journey and to provide some solid information to those curious about this dietary lifestyle. Right, now we have over 200 podcast episodes and some of which have been downloaded yeah. hundreds of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. And after failing miserably on Facebook, <laughs> and did we, <laughs> we moved our online community to the ketogenic forums, where now tens of thousands of people share their experiences. We also founded an annual ketogenic festival called KetoFest. Right. Carl and I are both software developers. As such, we found ourselves at software conferences several times a year. We tend to gravitate towards the conversations that happen in the hallways of the conference. Sure, the talks are great, but it's the community we enjoy the most. Right. So KetoFest is a conference to discuss the latest research of ketogenic diets, but it's also a festival celebrating the ketogenic lifestyle. And KetoFest.com is up right now and taking not registrations, but email addresses, names and email addresses of people who want to be notified when tickets go on sale. Nice. So, Carl, what is a ketogenic diet? Oh, that's a diet where instead of burning sugar and starch for energy, our cells preferentially burn fat. That produces molecules called ketones that our bodies use for fuel. Right. Our main molecular fuels are glucose, which we make from carbohydrates, and fatty acids, which we make from fat. Our cells have two modes. In one, they burn glucose and make fat, and in the other, they burn fatty acids and make ketones. But you don't have to eat a high-fat diet to be ketogenic. Well, when you're starting out, you may have to. But then in a few weeks, as you become better adapted to burning fat for energy, when most of your calories are coming from fatty acids, the amount you need to eat becomes coupled to satiety, which integrates not only the variable amount of energy that your body needs to run every day, but also the amount of fat that can be drawn down from storage. So how many carbs do we need to restrict ourselves to in order to get into that state? Well, that depends. Some of us who are metabolically disordered need to get below 20 grams a day. Somebody who's quite metabolically flexible can eat as much as 100 grams a day. Hmm, how about other nutrients like protein, minerals, and essential cofactors like vitamins and essential fats? Well, you need from 1 to 1.5 grams of protein for every kilo of lean mass. Beyond that, you just waste excess by turning it into energy instead of using fatty acids. As for the other essential nutrients, if you're eating fatty meats or eggs plus leafy green vegetables, you'll get most of those because those organisms that made those foods already concentrated those essential cofactors. Yeah, ketogenic diets are varied and delicious. They can be vegetarian or carnivore, home-cooked mm -hmm. or takeout, Hot cuisine. Hot cuisine. <laughs> or just bacon and eggs. Just imagine when I'm saying that I'm chewing on a capsicum or a bell, a bell pepper. <laughs> yeah, as long as your carbohydrates are low enough, uh, you're on a ketogenic diet. Right, and if you're an absolute beginner, check out our Starting Keto episode for more information at start.2keto.com. So this is another Two Keto Dudes classic show, a classics where we curate a show from our back catalogue that we believe has some timeless and sometimes timely information. We do save a little money by re-airing some content that we think is timely, and that's one of the reasons why we do 2KD classics. Carl and I still do this podcasting thing as a hobby. We both have day jobs, but we want to produce a professional show and that takes audio engineers to stitch together our shows and make us and our guests look good. And that costs some money. 
Yeah, the show is listener funded via Patreon, and you can go to support.2keto.com to help. And that goes towards paying audio engineers and other things. As our Patreon support grows, we plan to do more original content. This episode's not just a Two Keto Dudes classic, but it's a show all about the science of keto from the world's most experienced and knowledgeable scientists on the subject, Professor Stephen Finney. It's coincidentally a show that we aired three years ago to this date, on the 5th of November 2018. I was able to catch up with Professor Finney at the Low Carb Down Under conference at the Gold Coast, where Professor Finney graciously chose a time and place to sit down with me for an interview. I remember it was during a particularly dull talk about how you can, if you can only get your calories per nutrient down, you can achieve optimum nutrition. Clearly that idea is malarkey, or else a multivitamin pill would be the world's most effective weight loss pill. 100% of your daily non-caloric nutrients and no calories at all. That idea is a restatement of the eat less malarkey, and I'll Mm. unpack that fully in a future show. Anyway, Carl, how have you been since we last recorded? I've been okay. Um, it, uh, going through a little personal stress here uh, at uh, the Franklin household. Um, mm-hmm. Just family stuff. Not going to get into it, but um, everything's cool. But it's it's kind of stressful. So yeah, I've been eating too much lately, yeah. and yeah, and uh, although I was doing a regimen of keto chow uh, a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, and that really really helped. So I've got a new. Um, quart of apple pie keto chow in the fridge right now. Okay. That I made last night with heavy cream and it's, it's really good. So what I do, what I use that for is, you know, whenever I get a craving and those cravings seem to come out of nowhere. Um, you know, if I, 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 and I feel like, you know, my body is saying, you need to go to Wendy's. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I'm going to go to the fridge and hit on that keto chow. And literally within, you know, uh, three minutes, uh, it quashes the craving. So, mm-hmm. so that's my plan. And that's my, uh, my goal. Um, interestingly, mm-hmm. my wife had a blood test recently, Kelly, and, mm-hmm. She has found out that she has prediabetes. Oh dear. So she, yeah, her blood sugar is at a kind of a worrisome level. So right. she's going keto with me. Nice. <laughs> so finally, I'll be able to, <laughs> she'll be eating my food. <laughs> she finally, well, she's a picky eater. So it's going to be a challenge for you. So she is, you know. but you know, she also lives on Cheetos and, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, maybe she <laughs> needs to get on the, uh, what is it? Apple, apple pie. Keto uh, the, chow? The apple pie keto chow. Yeah. She actually likes the chicken soup okay. keto chow because yeah. it's savory mm-hmm. and use butter. And what's not to love about that? Right. But I mix it with real chicken stock and mm-hmm. add like mushrooms and stuff. And it's like dinner. It's really good. Delicious. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So how about you? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. I, uh, just a regular week. Um, we're out of lockdown and... Uh, and I can't go back into the lab just yet. I probably won't be able to get back into the lab till January, mm. um, which is a bit of a shame because I've got some work I need to do. Um, but I'm just working on uh, a, a study that, uh, you know, a, a, a scientific paper that um, I'm hopefully going to be first author on. So just hard work, you know, the usual stuff. Yeah. I've been working hard at software development myself, and uh, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, that's our day jobs, right? <laughs> that's right. Me, yeah. Me me being a baby scientist and you being a software developer. Yep. Well, I guess that brings us squarely to the segment that we call <laughs> And yes, we have decided to uh when we do these two keto dudes classics to do the check-in and to do some new mail and all of that stuff current uh, because things then, have changed. Because things have changed, and we don't want to say stuff again that's irrelevant. So, yeah. So, I went to Apple Podcasts, and can I just complain here for a bit? Go for it. Yeah. So, I'm looking for reviews because we have a lot of five-star reviews. Like, people oh, love this you, show. thank you, people, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, I, I went, and the, it only showed three on the website. Mm. So, okay. when I click see all, it needs me to open iTunes. Of 
course it does. They want you in there in their app, <laughs> which is like the worst app on Windows. It's I the worst app. With iTunes. <laughs> and and get this, you can't even copy the uh, the reviews, so you can paste them into you know like a document that we use show notes. Yeah. So so I have iTunes open here. So you have to read live because you can't copy and paste the content. That's right. <laughs> So, I mean, I suppose I could take a screenshot, chop it down, and stick that in the document, but okay. So, this one is from Sarah from August Mm -hmm. 5th, and Sarah says, you were really missed. It made my day to see you back. Carl, you nailed it when you said some of us really need the podcast. You dudes are really the best support group, and I'm thankful you've decided to get back into podcasting. So, again, welcome back, and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. That's very nice. Yeah, and thanks for everybody who have left 932 five-star reviews. Wow. 58 wow. four-star reviews, 28 three-star, 22 two-star, and one, uh, 27 one-star reviews. 27 vegans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. So my mail this week is going to be the same mail I did three years ago in the ep- in episode 141, The Grandfather of Nutritional Ketosis with Professor Stephen Finney, which is the interview that we're going to show today. Yeah. Now, in that episode I spoke about, in my mail, I spoke about some feedback that I got on social media for talking about vaccines. Yeah. I think that is a particularly timely. So let's hear what I had to say three years ago on the subject. I've got a dumpster fire that I started on Facebook. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and it, it, yeah, it, it happened because there was an article in the news about how Australia was on target to eradicate the uh, disease German measles or rubella. Okay. And in fact, I think we've removed all endemic infections of it from Australia. Okay. Um, and I made the comment on Facebook, you know, that this is what happens when you get herd immunity high enough. The virus cannot spread fast enough to sustain that type of rolling contagion that we used to have uh, in the 90s. Um, okay. And it, it happens once a, a population goes above a certain threshold. Once people live in a dense enough environment, the distance from one person to the next means that the virus can spread very quickly. Mm. This is what herd immunity means. Okay. If enough people have immunity, then it just slows the virus fast enough for their immune system to be able to, to stop it. Um, Got it. And it, it won't spread. And so, it, and there's a lot of people who think that uh, herd immunity sounds like um, socialism or, you know, it's, 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 oh, okay. it's all very well and good in theory, but, you know, it's not in practice. I remember when I went to university the first time around in the 80s, I was doing pure math and one of the first uh, assignments I had to do was to model uh, the process of herd immunity. And, uh, you know, it's a, it was a computer model. And basically you set up uh, – and you can, you can see these online. I'll put a link to one of them okay. um, in the show notes. But, but you, you, can, you can try these simulators. You can basically say, look, I'm going to say that, um, that my virus has a 70% chance of spreading from one person to another, mm-hmm. and I'm going to give my population a 30% chance of being immune to the virus, and okay. then you just infect one, you click on one person in, in the population, and you watch to see whether the virus will spread or not. And if you have enough people have a minimum amount of immunity, then it slows the virus enough so that it doesn't sort of propagate wow, and, great. Uh, through a community. And that's the thing with, you know, this is the thing, not everybody can get a um, vaccination. You know, the the elderly, the, the people who are immunocompromised, um, right. children, so not everyone can get a, a vaccination. And so, but if they are surrounded with enough people who are vaccinated, there's a good chance that, that the infection won't get to them. So okay. that's the theory. But of course, there's a lot of people in the ketogenic community um, who are also uh, anti-vaxxers. Right. And, um, and you know, one of the comments that I got was, you know, uh, uh, seriously, you understand the propaganda surrounding LCHF, but you have no understanding of vaccine safety. So, you know, it's huh. really that the, the argument is, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist about the whole uh, calories in, calories out, then surely you must be a conspiracy theorist about uh, vaccines. And and that doesn't necessarily follow it. I think it's important. I, I really want to put a marker down here and say that it's important for 
diabetics, for type 2 diabetics for whom a ketogenic diet is a cure, or at mm. least it's a, it's a reversal of their disease, right. um, it's too important to be conflated with a lot of other, uh, I mean, I, I don't really want to say fringe, but anti-vaxxing is a fringe, um, fluoride is a fringe, raw milk is a fringe. The, the, these are things that may turn out to be true, but the science is not there, whereas the science behind a ketogenic diet yeah. um, has been there for you know, 20 or 30 years and it's only getting stronger. And so, right. you know, it's one of these things that, you know, the ketogenic diet is something that the orthodoxy would not agree with. Yeah, and it's sort of understandable because of the nature of, you know, how the ketogenic diet came about, you you really mm. have to flip conventional wisdom on its head. And so it does right. really appeal to those who you know, the, the anti-vaxxers and the, the people who think that conventional scientific advice is wrong, and mm. maybe across the board, maybe not across the, the board. Contrarians. But, but they're yeah. contrarians, yeah, but, but you yeah. know, it sort of fits the model that, you know, mm. everybody's stupid, don't listen to anybody. And right. that's just not the case. It, like you said, it's based on science, and, you know, when, when the anti-vaxxers come up with science to show that, Yes, uh, taking this vaccine or that vaccine can have harmful effects. And guess what? Some of them do, but it's mm, not an yeah. across the board thing. You have to take mm. every vaccine and every treatment on an individual basis. You can't lump them all into the same, um, to the same thing. Yeah, and certainly don't don't conflate them with ketogenic diets because right. you know just because it's contrarian doesn't necess doesn't mean that. Uh, um, it's not supported by science, which it is. Uh, yes. We just have to wait for some dinosaurs in the Dietitians Association to, to, to move out of the way and let these young whippersnappers uh, <laughs> take control. Totally agree. Just try not to lump everything into the same bucket and take every piece of science on its own merit. I yeah. think that's the, the piece of advice. Heard you say you are do for a little... Okay, this is Richard back in 2021, and we're going to listen now to the interview with Professor Stephen Finney. Great. Speaking of science, yeah, uh, we have an interview with a real scientist. Yes, we do. This man, I, I caught up with him on, at Low Carb Gold Coast, and this is Professor Stephen Finney, and he's the guy that invented nutritional ketosis. Well, he invented the term. He, he coined did, the phrase. But he was also the only researcher for many years. That's you right. Know, he was the only researcher... Uh, we talk about the science behind that supports a low carb diet. Right. This man produced most of it. This man and, and Eric Westman, I think, and, and Jeff, Jeff Volick. Volick. Yeah. Um, you know, the, these are, uh, uh, and there's a few others like Tom D'Agostino, mm -hmm. but, but for the most part, Stephen Finney is the godfather and he likes to be called the grandfather of <laughs> nutritional ketosis. Grandpa Keto. <laughs> All right. Let's roll the conversation. I'm at low carb down under at the Gold Coast still, and this time my unique privilege is to speak to the godfather of nutritional ketosis, Professor Stephen Finney, who has come to Australia to speak at a, at a series of, of conferences, and this, this is the last one before he heads back home. And I thought we might talk about the subject of satiety because for a supposedly weight loss diet, this is unique about nutritional ketosis isn't it, that uh, y that your diet is ad libitum. And I think it's one of the only – all of the other diets seem to be, you know, tricks and techniques to to stop eating prior to satiety. Yeah, it's, it's a well-known observation among people who use or have tried themselves or th uh, practitioners who use a ketogenic diet that people seem to be able to lose weight um, more readily and for a longer duration of time mm. than when – employing a calorie restricted diet particularly one which is high enough in carbohydrates that it prevents nutritional ketosis right and so there's multiple published studies with calorie restricted diets say 1200 or 1400 calories a day which mm -hmm. for the average heavy person induces a thousand calorie per day deficit yeah that as the diet goes on mm. hunger and cravings increase yeah 
And so there is essentially a some termination point driven by physiological hunger. Your ability to resist. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like resisting a slow, inexorable force. Eventually, right. it gets the better of you, and you you abandon the diet. No matter how stoic you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there are people who can do this for six months and lose a lot of weight. Right. So it's rare that anybody goes beyond six months with a purposeful calorie restriction. Yeah. You know, there's some of the calorie-restricted longevity advocates hmm. who can – on average, do this for years, but they're very rare. Yeah. They're very rare that people can do that. Yeah. So you have a, a crescendo of subtle, I mean, cravings and you know, overt hunger mm -hmm. yeah. symptoms that build over time. Yeah. And most people see the opposite for up uh, for six months or longer mm. uh, with a well formulated ketogenic diet. And many people, ex you know, experience this. Reduction in hunger and cravings. You know, the appetite is there. You know, a couple times a day they feel, you know, a need to eat and are satiated, but it's, it's rarely as compelling as, as what builds up as one follows a prolonged calorie restricted non ketogenic regimen. Yeah. In fact, you, you actually use satiety as part of your signaling mechanism to determine how much energy somebody should take in, eat to satiety, fat to satiety. And there is a spontaneous recalibration over the period of weight loss where the body fat is producing less energy and the person tends to spontaneously eat a little bit more fat on their plates. And you, you're famous for the, the, the four charts where you show this yes. recalibration effect. But actually just kind of surfing on that a little mm. bit in terms of internal regulation, yeah. there was some elegant research done in the 1950s back when you – know, Post World War II, there, were, there wasn't a whole lot of research money available, and there was yeah. a, a, a remarkable uh, scientist in the UK named uh, Professor John Garrow. Okay, and he had a, a country escape place, maybe in in a, 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 in a village in in uh, the Scottish Highlands. Right, and there were about three hundred people who lived in this village, mm -hmm. and he would go there for a few weeks or a month every summer, I mean, whatever that three-week window was of summer in Scotland. <laughs> right. And, you know, it was just a place to go and get away from the city, from, from London. Mm. But since he was there, he'd bring along a scale, mm -hmm. and he'd weigh everyone in the village. Okay. Year after year, he weighed everyone in the village. And and, and took their names, so he knew. Yep. Right. And and uh, they all knew him, and yeah. he knew them. He was a crazy <laughs> professor from, from London. And the man with the scale. <laughs> the man with the scale. And, and he would record their weight year after year. And, mm. you know, kids and adolescents gained weight. Uh, women, when they uh, uh, were pregnant, gained weight. Mm -hmm. if, you know, perhaps they retained a few pounds after each pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But for barring pregnancy and barring uh, major illness or disease in the adults, their weights were remarkably stable for years and even decades at a time. Wow, yeah. Now, the average adult eats somewhere between 750,000 and a million calories a year, and yet mm. their bodies, you know, a, a normal weight adult body will contain anywhere from 50 to 100,000 calories. So people were eating 10 to 20 times their weight and energy each year, yeah. and yet their weight was just staying stable within a few pounds. Right. And they weren't counting calories. Yeah. Nobody was saying eat this much or eat that much, yeah. which implies that we, we under unperturbed circumstances, Without we, derangement. Yeah. we as adults have internal instincts that let us get within 1%. That's a of, remarkable of our daily energy intake yeah. year in and year out. That's a remarkable accuracy. Yeah. And there are some people who are gaining persistently, but mm -hmm. you know, this is the fifties and yeah. we didn't have a huge amount of sugar and re you know, highly refined carbs. And particularly in Scotland, you know, mm, you sure. can't get fat eating haggis, you know. <laughs> so it clearly when you get the, even a, a carb containing diet right, most people have homeostatic mechanisms that are very precise and are instinctive. Yeah. So, what we seem to have discovered mm. is that when we get people on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, we recreate those instinctive mechanisms, but not at the weight that you're at now, but by inducing nutritional ketosis, somehow that sets the, the new target for the body's homeostatic mechanism at a lower level. Right. People have called that the set point. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think we should call it a settling point because it's settling because mm. you can change it by changing diet composition. Yeah. Uh, but nutritional ketosis seems to induce a new settling point for people mm. that may not be exactly where they want to be, but a lot lower than where they are in a insulin resistant, particularly with diabetes or metabolic syndrome uh, disease state. So 
how would you define a nutritionally ketogenic diet? Being that you you came up with the term, you invented it, so you get to be the definitive definition. So yes, and by the way, I prefer to be called the grandfather of nutritional <laughs> okay. ketosis, not the godfather. Not the godfather. Okay. Uh, you know, Fair I, enough. I don't take out contracts on okay. people. <laughs> Fair enough. Back in the late 1970s, when I initiated this line of research, all we physicians were taught were you know, that not having measurable ketones in your blood or in your urine was a good thing, mm. and that ketones were, were a toxic byproduct of fat metabolism. Uh, and when we saw them, it was usually in, in, the, in the circumstance of either total starvation, because someone had been stuck in a lifeboat without food, or yeah. that, that somebody was in ketoacidosis. Mm. And so, we define nutritional ketosis as ketones in a, a range which had no threat to the mm. body, and we now know actually has multiple, not just fuel benefits, but health signaling right. benefits. And so, that's a range that begins at maybe 0.5 mm -hmm. millimolar, yeah. uh, seems to be more beneficial when one gets to 1 millimolar, and the range between 1 and 3 appears to be a good zone for fueling and signaling within mm. the body. Mm. And yeah, people sometimes say, oh, your ketones are elevated to one to, into one to three range. I say, no, mm -hmm. they're in the one to three range. Yeah. That's not elevated. That's a normal physiological state for people when they're eating a diet that would reflect a traditional hunter or herder mm. society's diet. Yeah. So one gets there by limiting carbohydrates for most people, unless they're very physically active, under 50 grams per day. And for mm -hmm. people who are insulin resistant, more to more in the uh, the 30 gram per day of total carb yeah. intake range, keep and keeping protein in moderation. Because again, the more one increases protein above the required amount to maintain lean body mass, mm. the rest of that protein is turned into carbohydrate and, yeah. and can influence ketone production. Yeah. It, protein really isn't a good energy source. It's like the third source of energy, I guess, if you don't include alcohol or um, sugar alcohols well, or exogenous ketones. Alcohol, then, then, then protein is a fourth energy <laughs> yeah, source. okay. Extra protein, th there are no benefits and considerable downsides to, mm. to overeating protein. And again, when we look at Aboriginal cultures where mm. we have accurate measurements, uh, and that means, you know, where learned individuals, learned literate individuals yeah. uh, could – observe and write down what people were eating, whether mm. were they the Maasai people in the Great Rift Valley, mm -hmm. uh, and there were uh, some British researchers who lived among them when they were still following their, mm -hmm. their original pastoral diet, right. the Native Americans of the Great Plains, their lifestyle was recorded by a remarkable painter named George Catland, who traveled among them in the 1830s, uh, because that was the time before the camera, mm. uh, he felt that, that he knew that that they were going to be displaced from their truck from their ancestral lands, so he took paints and and paint brushes and canvases and went west of the Mississippi and there are now still two hundred and fifty of his paintings and two thick volumes of his writings that, mm. that recorded the lifestyle of these people. And the ones who were nomadic and followed the buffalo, who didn't plant corn, beans, sure. squash, mm. um, uh, lived on a, on a, a almost totally carnivorous diet with some gathered foods, mm. uh, but very low in carbohydrate. And what we find from those two cultures, the Maasai, the, the buffalo people of the Great Plains, and the Inuit in the Arctic, is that they habitually ate a very moderate protein intake and a very mm. high fat intake. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a high fat diet. Yeah. Uh, so they somehow instinctively figured out that from a macronutrient maintenance intake, um, that about 15% of energy intake mm. as protein appeared to be the right amount. But since the carb intake was so low, that was, you know, that put them in the 80% of energy as fat intake when they right. were maintaining their weight. Yeah. Uh, so it's very different than the high protein diet that many people uh, assume that this is, and and, and even the, the about twice that protein intake that is typically the target for the paleo approach to low carb nutrition. Yeah, I know that Aboriginal Australians prioritise the the tail of the kangaroo, and the kangaroo itself is really quite lean. Kangaroo meat's delicious, but when I cook with it, I always have to add extra fat. Mm -hmm. um, but the tail is where most of the fat is, and it's also convenient because it's a handle that you can carry as you're walking you know, through the bush and yep. so uh and so you would see um you know a, 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 a family group ca walking carrying this fatty 
kangaroo tail uh, by the tail and they'd toss the rest of the, the, the meat. The, the brains would go to the children as, as, as baby food. So mm-hmm. they'd, they'd, they'd mash the brains up for baby food and then the hunters would get the tail at priority and then all of the lesser people in the, in the family would get more lean and more, mm-hmm. increasingly more lean meats. So they also used to hunt the turtles only in the season where the turtles were fattest. And so they, they, and, and this is, Australia is, is unique in that it's a continent that doesn't make a lot of carbohydrates. I think our most carbohydrate laden grain is wattle seed, which is only 10% carbs, 10% mm. starch. So, um, and also I think the, the only real sugars are from insects, honey ants and bees. And, and so there's not a lot of sugar here. So this is a population of people who couldn't live on a high carbohydrate diet. And as you say, they, they instinctively, Possibly over sixty thousand years, that instinct kicked in. Sure. They 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 developed this this eating practice, which, uh, uh, as you say, is is you know it's, it's it's mostly energy from fat. Sure. Among the people who uh, followed the buffalo mm. in their seasonal migration, mm. um, they in the in the fall, they the 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 time to to for their major hunting was was in the fall when the buffalo had built up uh, subcutaneous fat. For right. both energy reserve and, and, and insulation. Yeah. And some buffalo males would have a back hump, mm. a, a hump of fat on the rear part of their back that would weigh up to a hundred kilograms. Wow. A fat. couple hundred pounds of yeah. fat. Mm. And you know, you skin the buffalo, you take off this, <laughs> literally you have two people carrying the saddle of fat. Mm. Uh, and of course they would save that. They'd dry the meat. They'd make something called pemmican. So they'd dry the meat, either sun dry it or smoke it to dry it, yeah. pound it into a, a, a a soft fibrous mix mm. in, in put it stuff it into a rawhide sack and then pour in the rendered hot fat right and you'd get this block of meat encased in fat and yes. of course this is ruminant fat so it's solid at room temperature kind yeah. of like butter yeah a uh, little more higher in, in fat or in, in saturated fat than butter content mm. and you could carry that sack with you for months if not up to a year uh, and the energy density was such that if you're in camp not working hard, you could live on a pound of that pemmican per day. That's incredible. Um, yeah. So they treasured the fat. But in the spring and early summer and late winter, when mm-hmm. the when the fat amount was reduced, as you say, they would selectively consume the animals. Mm. Uh, and the, the treasured parts were the fat around the kidneys, um, the tongue. The tongue always had fat in it. The, and the tongue's bone, quite fatty, And yeah. the bone marrow. <laughs> and you would find these piles of cracked uh, <laughs> buffalo long bones, yeah. you know, smash them open with stones and scoop out the marrow. Mm. Uh, and of course, before they got the horse, they were dog people. Yeah. Uh, they lived for 10,000 years with dogs. Right. They only had horses for the last 300 years before mm. they were sort of driven into reservations by, sure. by people with guns. Right. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, they, the, the dogs got the lean. Yeah. Because dogs can live on up to 50% of their energy intake. Coming from from the from protein lean, component yeah, of food, yeah. whereas humans, if we go over thirty percent, we begin to get sick. Yeah, I think it's the. I, I saw a paper that said that the process urogenesis saturates at roughly three point three grams per kilogram of lean body mass intake. So, so that really that's really the cap, and above that, some people can can make urea better than others, mm-hmm. uh, but above that, you start getting into the danger zone. I think that you. I remember you talking about um, uh, rabbit starvation, mal de caribou in Arctic explorers. And that is that's really where you get this cap of amount of energy that you can get from protein. Sure. Yeah, the Inuit knew that in the springtime they had to find sources of fat. And so they would get out um, when they came uh, – they would be out on the ice hunting seal. Mm. Um, but once the ice broke up and until the caribou returned, um, it was a period of privation. And they, their weight would cycle yeah. about with the availability of the hunt. Mm. Um uh, but they also had uh, early runs of fish, and there are certain fish, and certainly eels were a, ah. a rich source. Real, eels, interesting, are about 25% by weight fat. Really? Uh, and so... Uh, apparently, um, apparently Ansel Keys was a famous eel physiologist. Oh. I heard. <laughs> I, I, I did not know that. No, he, apparently. Even a few times I met him, he didn't, didn't brag he about He didn't mention that, it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hear a lot of people talking about... Um, uh, you know, I, I eat a lot of protein and I still make ketones. Are they, are they necessarily on a, a ketogenic diet? I guess if they're making ketones, in theory, it's ketogenic, but it's not nutritional ketosis. Yeah. If, if one is not eating any dietary carbohydrate, mm. um, although any visible carbohydrates from right. vegetable sources or, or grains, yeah. um, 
uh, and one eats you know two and a half grams of protein per kilogram reference body weight. Mm. Um, one can still be in ketosis, yeah. But the ketones go, are somewhat higher when you're at one point five grams per kilo, yeah. Um, so you know, someone can follow a you know, you know the current kind of concept of a carnivorous diet mm. uh, in the uh, you know uh, two to three gram per kilo protein intake range, right? Uh, and still have ketones. Um, again, the more insulin resistant a person is, the, the, the greater the tendency for them to be held down. Yeah. The more physical activity someone has, particularly endurance physical activity, that's a factor that helps bring ketones up somewhat. Right. But the, uh, when we do give one point, in, in my study on bicycle racers that we published in 1983, mm. we gave them 1.5 grams per kilo as, as, um, um, meat and fat. Yeah. Um, with, uh, no vegetable matter. Mm hmm. Uh, and their ketones averaged about 2.5 millimolar. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't do a high protein range in that metabolic ward study to look at the effect of um, more or less doubling the protein intake. Yeah, the ketones would have been lower than that. They would have been, yeah. yeah. And potentially zero. P potentially that. Well, potentially, yeah. certainly mm. under uh, yeah. 0 0.5. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, one of my favorite studies of yours is the is the metabolic ward study where you uh, had, I think it was 16 women, you locked in a metabolic ward and you fed them identical meals and you had half of them exercise and half of them not. And would you like to talk about that one? Because that, that was fascinating. That was counterintuitive. The results from that are counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it makes sense that the body's, you know, prioritizing its energy intake and uh, and if you're going to get get exercise uh, do you want to talk about that well again that was the, that was not a food diet that was a formula weight loss diet oh okay of, of about 800 calories per day mm -hmm. um and there, there were it was a total of 12 women half of them remained sedentary the other half we had uh add in exercise we gave them the first week of the very low calorie diet mm -hmm. um which had 30 grams of carbs per day. Okay. Um, we gave them the first week of that diet to begin the adaptation process. And then we eased them into exercise by doing half an hour a day the second week of the study, an hour a day of exercise. And this was monitored on a stationary cycle. Mm. And then for the last, so first week, none, half an, half an hour per day, the second week, right. third week, an hour a day. And then weeks four and five, we had them do two hours a day. Mm. Uh, now, this was a, at a very modest uh, pace. This is 60% of peak aerobic power, okay. which uh, for them was, you know, exercising at a, an energy expenditure of about 350 calories per hour. Okay. So, they were burning about at, at the two hours per day um, uh, rate, that was about 700 calories per day, and that about equaled the amount of calories they were eating with right. this diet, which is yeah. seven to 800 calories per day. So, in theory, they should have been a net zero. And what we and what I was pursuing was this concept that exercise that exercise counters the weight or the resting metabolic rate depression that comes with caloric restriction. I see. So the six women who did n no exercise, mm -hmm. no purposeful exercise, other right. than sat on you know, couch w and, yeah. walking around the metabolic ward. Yeah. Those six women had a ten percent reduction in resting metabolic rate that, that occurred in the first week, and then that the, that reduction in metabolic rate was stable for the rest of the study. Right. So the body sensed immediately that it was in a privation condition, turned the thermostat down by 10%. Yeah. But as they got the, enough protein to preserve lean body mass, enough minerals to, to, you know, fill in the cracks between the protein and allow the body to maintain uh, physiological functions. Yeah. That 10% was a constant uh, response to the that degree of caloric restriction and in, insulin was low enough so that they could mobilize energy out of the fat stores and to mobilize it into mitochondria to be oxidized yeah the so, average, the, so average access, the average yeah. woman in that study lost uh, six kilograms right in six weeks or mm -hmm. in five weeks yeah uh, so that was uh, a uh, and it was it was a variation between individuals mm. you know some lost faster some lost slower yeah um but what was fascinating is that the resting metabolic rate to the group that the six who did the exercise mm -hmm. as we added half an hour one hour and then two hours of per week of exercise again they came down 10 percent the first week because then they were doing no exercise just sure. like the control group mm. but then the added exercise caused a progressive further decrease in <laughs> right. resting metabolism yeah. so at the end of the five weeks of the intervention they're the full effect of caloric restriction plus exercise was a 25% 
right. reduction in resting metabolism. And, and no significant difference in, in, in weight loss. There was no difference in weight loss. Right. Yeah. None. So, so it's, 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 and that's remarkable because you would think if, if you take two people and one person and they eat the same thing and one person exercises one, two, up to two hours on a treadmill, walking mm-hmm. at a, probably jogging at a, at a reasonable pace on a treadmill. We had them on a stationary cycle. A oh, stationary cycle. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, <clears throat> on a stationary cycle at a, at a, at a, at a reasonable uh, pace. Yeah, they were they were breathing, but not huffing and puffing. All right. Yeah. So that's that's, that's that's what most of us would do at the yeah. gym if we we're on sure. an aerobic kick. And so uh, you would expect that the person who spends two hours on a treadmill every day uh, is going to lose more weight than the person who sits on the couch and does nothing but eats the same amount of food. And, and these people found that, that these were not hmm. people who traditionally or habitually did a lot of exercise. Yeah. But what? They found the two hours of exercise to be a lot of work. Yeah, of course. Them. Yeah. <laughs> but realize there's 24 hours in a the day. They're spending two hours a day on the treadmill. Yeah. You know, and tripling their rate of energy expenditure. Mm-hmm. But when they, for the other 22 hours, for the other 22 hours a day, if their metabolic rate was reduced by an additional 15% at right. resting metabolic rate, you add it up and that amount cancels out the exercise. Yeah. So the body had very accurately done the math. Yeah. And said, you're feeding me seven or 800 calories a day, but then you're forcing me to do seven or 800 calories a day of, of, of energy expenditure with exercise. Yep. So this looks to me, me, my body saying, yeah. this looks to me like total starvation. Yeah. And we know from study after study of, of fasting, where mm. people fast for three to six weeks, sure. that there is a very dependable, on average, 25% reduction in resting mm. metabolic rate. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so this just gets back to our energy homeostasis, but gets us back to satiety because it's all part of the same system. It, mm-hmm. It's that we think that, I mean, intuitively, we, we think that the person who did the more exercise should lose more weight or the amount of calories that we eat minus the energy that we, that, that we calculate that we're using. If we mess with that ratio, we should be able to gain or lose weight. And it, it, it just shows that the body is a little bit smarter than that. Mm-hmm. Now, our energy output is linked to the uh, energy intake. It's it's a, in mathematical terms, it's a complex function. So uh, it's I, a, yeah, I wouldn't. They're just correct that, that okay. I wouldn't <laughs> say smart. I would say that we have a highly evolved instinctive mechanism that we don't control intellectually. Yes, that regulates our energy balance. Mm. And when we undergo periods of privation, the body goes into uh, conservation mode. Mm-hmm. And most people, when they're overfed, it increases their resting metabolism. But some people increase much more than others. There's some people can who can overeat a lot and their metabolism speeds up and they'll burn that extra off. Other people, their body says, good, great, thanks. I'm going to put it in, put it in the bank account. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, there's inter- inter-individual variation to that response, but we all have highly evolved autonomous regulatory mechanisms. Yeah. And so, again, the, the, what we've learned to, to leverage is when we put people on a ketogenic diet, we take away the high insulin storage signal yeah. or markedly reduce it, is we give the per- body permission to kind of – to increase its rate of fat oxidation. Yeah. And that rate of fat oxidation initially is not countered by fat hunger. Right. Uh, but again, we've come to predict – see in ourselves when we try this in ourselves and predict for our patients mm. that once they get to a new homeostatic level – Yeah. Um, there is a signal that as long as you don't eat carbs, that, that says eat more fat. Mm, yes. And, and, you know, when we tell people about this, they say, oh, yeah, that's happening to me. <laughs> you know, I open the refrigerator and the butter looks good. Yeah. Or yeah. I walk through, pe- through the, past the grocer's case. Yes. And I look at, at skim milk or non-fat yogurt and I say, ooh, but the high fat <laughs> yogurt or the, right. the full fat cream and cheese looks good. Once you tell people that this could be occurring, and we're not planting a seed. We're just helping them um, see what, what is instinctively there driving their, their desire to eat. Yeah. That, uh, it appears the body can adjust what looks good to it to uh, match its physiological needs. Yeah. Something in our environment perturbed us it deranged us and, and some people have said it's seed oils high amounts of polyunsaturated oils in our diet or trans fats or carbohydrates um at, but whatever it is wh- whatever thing makes us go off the rails we definitely go off the rails i was i 
I was 150 kilos. And I, when I went on a ketogenic diet, within about five months, I was 100, 103 kilos was where I alighted. And I've gotten down to 101 various times, and I'm currently 106. And that's been for how many years now? It's four years. Yeah. And, and I, I eat to satiety. I um I eat ad, ad libitum. I eat whatever I want as long as it's not carbs. And in that interval of time, you've probably eaten, I'm guessing, this is going to horrify you, 4 million <laughs> calories. Okay. And yet your weight has varied 4 kilos. Yes. Which means uh, 20,000 calories out of 4 million. You can yeah. do the... Yeah, just, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and you haven't counted calories in that time no, period, I guess. Not, not once. Yeah. I, I have I have measured what I ate sometimes because mm-hmm. I, I do various N of 1 experience, right. experiments, yeah. as we all do. Mm-hmm. But um, it's a little bit like uh, I just turned down the thermostat and then the AC and the heater did all of the job of, of regulating the room to the new to, to the new normal. But that um, – um, the, it, it was at Phil, It was effortless. And what makes it – a major epiphany for me and what caused me to then become a podcaster and then go back to school to do biochemistry was that I went for 20 years unable to control, knowing that I had to eat less or move more, unable to do either. And all of a sudden, I make a slight change. It's just a remarkable thing. So it, 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 it is the hallmark of the, of the, the ketogenic diet or nutritional ketosis. And you've actually, Shown experimentally and clinically um, with the Verta study, you 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 work for a company called Verta. You're the chief medical officer, mm-hmm. and uh, with uh, Sarah Hulberg, who's been on our podcast before, uh, you've done an interesting experiment, haven't you? Would you, would you like to talk we've about? A, we've had the opportunity to do a fascinating experiment. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically a proof of concept around some of the the uh, you know, based on some of the prior shorter term research that Jeff Volek and I have done. Um, uh, in in which um, we've taken pe- in previously people with metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes, which yeah. is associated like diabetes with underlying insulin resistance and mm-hmm. inflammation. Yeah, and with a well-formulated ketogenic diet, we see a prompt before major weight loss, a mm. prompt reduction in insulin resistance, and a prompt reduction in inflammation biomarkers. Yeah, and we do that with patients who have weight to lose. Uh, without counting calories, just holding carbohydrates low enough and protein in moderation so they go into nutritional ketosis, people without counting calories lose quite a bit of weight. Mm. And typically it's in the 10 to 20% of their uh, uh, initial body weight. I think for me it was 33% so mm-hmm. yeah. in the end. So. Yeah. Again, you're, Maybe I'm an outlier. <laughs> well, I, I would say you're, you uh, uh, have brought a unique uh, perspective to this that, that probably enhances your ability to do this mm. because of your desire to understand the process. That's very, uh, com- and, very true, probably. Yeah. And so in, in the study that we did with Sarah Hallberg, mm. uh, when we started the company uh, Verta Health, and we were looking for a, a, a proof of concept study to demonstrate not just that this works in the short term, but that we can put people on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, keep them on that diet, not by force, but by education. Right. And they're, they're willingly help, on it. They're, they're, they're help, help, invested in it. Yes. Yeah. Help <laughs> them perceive the, the, the biochemical benefits. You know, mm. we, they test their ketones with a, with a, a blood, finger stick blood ketone meter. But these are people with type 2 diabetes and they're testing their glucose and they're seeing values, their, their, their elevated values come down to the normal range. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes quite promptly. They're getting off of medications, uh, that had unpleasant side effects and cost them considerable co-pays for, uh, in terms of cost of medication. So there are real observed benefits. Um, uh, and then they're, they're, of course, with diabetes, they're tracking this biomarker called hemoglobin A1C. And, mm-hmm. you know, for some of them had diabetes for a decade. The average person had right. diabetes for six years when we enrolled them in the study. Mm. And, you know, for six years, their physicians had been, you know, begging, cajoling, or even wagging their finger at them saying, get your, you know, you got to get this thing down. You yeah. got to eat less, less move calories, <laughs> move more, yeah. uh, lose some weight. And of course, then they're giving them medications that make insulin, either insulin or sulfonylureas that make insulin go up, which sure. counter the yeah. the body's ability to burn fat yeah uh, and yet when when people start seeing success it's a you know and they're empowered by that process it's before weight loss too a lot of these things so yeah, they, they're, they're probably the, seeing glucose yeah, we, we get we, we reduce medicines by more than ha- medications 
for diabetes by more than half. And much of that occurs, almost all of that occurs in the first month or two. Yeah. And yet the weight loss goes on for eight months. Yeah. Uh, the weight loss is, again, people are eating fat to satiety, mm -hmm. protein in moderation, and carbs being restricted so that they keep their ketones up in the desirable range above 0.5 millimolar. It's just the homeostasis They're not, they're not counting calories, <laughs> yeah. and yet uh, the weight loss isn't, you know, super fast, mm. but uh, you know, we, we saw <laughs> on average in this group of over, you know, 260 people with type 2 diabetes, the average weight loss was 12.5% at eight months. Wow. And then it flattened out and stayed constant out to the end of the first year. And that was pretty much my experience. And then I, 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 I maybe went up a very small, modest amount, maybe 10% mm -hmm. of, of a retracement, but, but insignificant for, you know, a, for, for I'm, a, you know, it's a satisfactory weight loss. Sure. If, you know, I tell the people this who hit a plateau all the time, you know, just think, you know, you're, you're, however many, you're kil so many kilograms away from where you started and you're complaining that you went up one or two kilo kilograms and you, you know, and mm -hmm. that you can't lose that last 10 kilograms of uh, fat that you'd like to use. But, the, you know, so far you've come. You know, right. and part of part of this we have to realize is that being in nutritional ketosis is not magically going to make people go back to where they were no. at a younger age at a much leaner level. Mm. Um, and uh, so we can't, you know, recreate a a the the perfectly lean person people want to be. Yeah. So part of this is managing expectations. The average person who goes on a on a diet on a on a carbohydrate calorie restricted diet, the majority don't lose more than five percent of their initial body weight. Yeah. Uh ten percent is a remarkable value. Twelve and a half percent, yeah. And, so, and it's not persistent so, either. They, they 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 put it all back on. If 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 people are on a restricted diet, mm. typically weight is regained within one to two years <sighs> from the start of the diet. Yeah. Uh, and and so you know as you point out um you know we have we don't we don't want to let i guess the phrase is we don't want to let perfect be the enemy of good mm. uh and and for i think the statistic is fewer than five percent of people who undertake a weight loss diet uh for for health reasons mm. um not just for for you know vanity but for health reasons sure. fewer than five percent lose thirty pounds. Wow. Yeah, you know, the mean weight loss in our study, I think, was thirty-four pounds. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the majority of of people, um, uh, you know, if we were giving grades for this, they'd get an A or an A plus grade. They sure would. Uh, mm. And and you know, there we reverse diabetes in about half the people who who start our program. It, for the people who retain, who stay in the program, at the, and that's about eighty-three percent of the people stay in our program at the end of one year. Yeah, sixty percent of them have put basically our diabetes back into. Mm. Uh, into uh, a reversed state. We don't say remission. We mm -hmm. obviously don't say cure because if they go back to eating carbohydrates, uh, that's going to come back. Yeah. It's, it's, but so their, the defense between the return of diabetes and, and their health is mm -hmm. continuing to restrict carbohydrates to keep these, you know, ancient little high potency molecules called ketones. Yeah. Working for them in their bloodstream. Yeah. And people can do, you know, it, it's feasible to do this long term as long as people are adequately coached and guided and understand that, that the health benefits of re sustaining the uh, state of nutritional ketosis. Yeah. How long have people done this for? How, how long have, I mean, obviously people, uh, obviously, uh, Inuit people have done this for, for 20,000 years, maybe, but how, how long have, in the modern era, how long, uh, have people, uh, followed your nutritional ketogenic diet or a, a progenitor to yours? And, and I mean, do we have, information about people who've done it for 10 years 20 years we have anecdotes mm -hmm. but i'm uh in terms of adults we don't have that much experience with long-term use of ketogenic diets right and in uh from the early or from the late 1970s when i started doing research in this through about uh 2010 mm. so over a 30 year period of time i did not promote a long-term ketogenic diet right because I had not proven to my satisfaction that using modern foods, hmm. that it could be really be safe. Yeah. I mean, we knew the Aboriginal cultures did this, but we destroyed those cultures before we studied them. Yes. I mean, we have some pretty good evidence around the Inuit, mm -hmm. um, fairly good evidence in terms of the Maasai, but we don't have detailed records of, of what, if any, plant foods they ate. 
it is said that among the nomadic Native Americans who, who lived on the buffalo mm. and followed the buffalo, it's said that the women tended to eat gathered foods, yeah. particularly during pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And you can make, you know, there, there is a need for magnesium and potassium and phosphorus, and it may be sure. more than you get from getting enough um, energy from, from a moderate protein intake. Mm. Um, so we didn't know the safety factors. And of course, there's this tremendous fear of fat that we have. And the idea that you feed someone 70 or 80% of their daily energy intake as yeah. fat is horrifying to anybody with, with, you know, a, a basic or advanced nutrition education. Mm. Uh, and so I didn't, wa- I didn't want to advocate something we hadn't proven safe. So working with Jeff Volek from 2003 till 2010, we basically researched the, the fate of saturated fats that were eaten. And it mm-hmm. turns out that when you become keto adapted, you, you double the ability, the body's ability to burn fat for energy. Right. Uh, both at rest and during exercise. Yeah. In highly trained runners who eat a high carbohydrate diet, we found that the highest fat oxidation was less than one gram of fat per minute. Mm. At their peak fat burning during exercise, yeah, the, the, uh, an identical person adapted to the ketogenic diet not for a few weeks, but for three to six months or longer. Right. And it takes that mm-hmm. long. That keto adapted runner can burn fat at two grams per minute. Wow, um, one point seven uh, grams per minute, as opposed to point seven or point eight grams per minute. Right. So we're so it gets the rewriting body. the rec- rewriting the 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 phys- books on physiology. Yeah, it's, I mean. it's 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 this, the the, the mm. you know, racing a four cylinder car against an eight cylinder car, and <laughs> and the, the, the for fat oxidation, a keto adapted individual is an eight cylinder engine in terms of fat power, not four cylinder engine. Right. So they uh, can use fat much faster, and it turns out that the mo- that the um, uh, primary fuels the body likes are saturated and monounsaturates, and mm. the saturates don't build up, even though people eat a lot of them, yeah. because they're being burned for fuel on a nice. real-time basis. You know, the tank never doesn't overflow with saturates when it's being tapped into as the body's energy, uh, asleep, awake, running, walking, whatever. I know there are some activists who say on a diet high in animal foods that uh, those are necessarily high in saturated fat. Uh, that they are necessarily bad for cardiovascular health because a buildup of saturated fat is linked to an instance of cardiovascular disease. Yes. But potentially those people on that doesn't necessarily mean what you're eating is what's building up. Yeah. It's, it's, it, 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 there's this old adage that you are what you eat, yeah. and that's incorrect. Mm. The correct way to state that is you are what you save from what you eat. Right. So the people who preach against saturated fat have it half right. Hmm. That when you take a blood sample from someone and measure how much saturated fat there is in their blood, Mm -hmm. and then you follow them for a decade and see... What, how many people develop diabetes, heart disease, or or or, or die of, of any cause? Yeah. The higher the saturated fat in the bloodstream, the greater the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and mortality. Mm. That's absolutely true. It's been yeah. shown in multiple studies mm. in multiple countries. But because nutritional ketosis doubles the body's capacity for fat oxidation, mm. it basically protects the body from that buildup. And so when we purposely feed people three times as much saturated fat per day on a ketogenic diet for 12 weeks yep. versus a low-fat diet with one-third as much saturated fat in the diet. And we draw the blood samples. Mm-hmm. The and this is, These are weight loss diets, mm. but, uh, yes. you know, eaten to satiety in terms of the, the ketogenic diet. Mm-hmm. The people on the ketogenic diet actually have lower levels of saturated mm-hmm. fat in the blood despite the fact we're eating three times as much. So right. it completely destroys this concept that yeah. you are what you eat. Uh, that you are what you you are, you are what's left from you know I after you've used it for energy <laughs> I, I eat ten times my weight and energy each year and what I have left is what my body's decided to save and being on a ketogenic diet allow gives my body much more power yeah. to sift through those things and save the things it wants to save and not be forced to save things that might do me damage yeah potentially the people who are eating a high carbohydrate diet are less able to metabolize uh, uh, saturated fats and that's in why fact, they're hanging around in fact for many of them the the, the if they're insulin resistant they can't burn the carbohydrates adequately and that gets turned into saturated fat in the liver right and so you actually now we block the body's mm. ability to burn the saturated fats that are always there but it forces the body to make more saturated fats wow Well, this has been a fascinating chat. Thank you very much for this. It's been a great pleasure. And I look forward to seeing the next study coming out of Verda because I know you've got a two-year study coming up, don't you? Yes, we're in the process of of writing up our two-year data. Excellent. So we have it. We've analyzed it. Mm -hmm. The difficulty there is getting past 
peer the, peer, the peer reviewed process, which has not been friendly to this in the past, but we yeah. think there's there's movement now, and some journals, the editors are mm-hmm. are more willing to to send their papers out to to potentially favorable review, reviewers rather than sending them out to the ones who would dependably trash us for yeah. for <laughs> preaching heresy. <laughs> so, Richard, it's been great talking to yeah. you as well. Thank you. And uh, mm-hmm. I hope within six months or so we'll have this data out. And in the study we're doing with. Dr. Hallberg at Indiana University of Health mm-hmm. is now slated to go for a full five years. Excellent. Well, it's ve- two years is very important to me because two years is used as uh, as, a, as the the discriminator for long term dietary adherence and long term dietary outcomes. And if you can show outcomes after two years that show people are getting healthier, then nobody can ever say that a ketogenic diet is not adequate for long term use. Yes. And we're also monitoring other biomarkers such as lipoprotein, particle sizes, biomarkers of inflammation. Great. So. So we'll have a lot of information going forward that will inform us in mm. terms of uh, how safe we feel this mm. will be as a long-term strategy. And the safer it is, the more we can extend it out to less threatened segments of the population. But right now, we know people with diabetes have a marked increased risk of cancer and heart disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so any potential small increased risks that might be associated uh, with some aspects of this diet are completely counterbalanced by the, the reversing all those risks of cardiovascular disease and, and cancer that, that uh, are associated with diabetes. Great. Thank you. Heard you say you do for a little. Wow. It's, it's so cool. And, you know, there's nothing like science to show that um, – satiety is what it's all about mm-hmm. and you know yeah if you stall just keep calm and keto on man yeah pretty much eat to satiety it is i mean that's that's the thing that's unique about the ketogenic diet really um you know it's uh satiety is, is a is a fuel signal that works if you get the derangement out of the way um you know yeah it'll tell you when you need to get more energy and when you don't exactly well that was an awesome interview thank you for getting that hey you're welcome so I think it's time for some recipes. recipes. <laughs> Man, I practically pegged it on that one. Yeah. Uh, you want to go first? Carl's got a Valkyrie in his uh, audio booth. <laughs> All right, so you go first, Bob. Sure. Well, this is the, here's the problem. It's Carnivember. We don't have recipes <laughs> for Carnivember. It's meat, salt, and water. It's not go. rocket surgery. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a trick for a snack in the fridge for when you're a bit peckish. Now, mm. you know, if you're, if you're carnivore, you probably won't be peckish. But if you just have a craving for just something, a little something, right? Uh, what I suggest doing is getting a tray, putting out some baking paper on that tray, parchment paper, yep. and then laying bacon on it and putting another piece of parchment paper on it and putting another tray on top of it (laughs) and cooking it until that bacon is delicious. And what you want to do, is the reason for the the tray on top is to make sure that the bacon stays perfectly flat. And then while the bacon is still warm, pull it off the tray and I put it in a a, a, uh, bowl in my fridge. And so I have a... I have a bacon bowl in the fridge with flat perfectly cooked bacon the good thing about cooking it in the tray is that you don't render a lot of the fat out that's so right the fat is in situ it stays so, in it um it stays in it and so here's the trick is uh i have some philadelphia cream cheese mm. and i put a little smear of cream cheese on top of that bacon and you know you can put a little smear of vegemite on if that's your particular yeah, fancy yeah, yeah. It's a little bacon cream cheese sandwich. It is. There you go. So that's my recipe. What do you got, Carl? That's a great one. And I do remember way back when we started this podcast, that was one of the strategies for keeping in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the fridge, just a schmear of cream cheese on a piece of bacon and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. So good. There you go. Yep. All right. Well, I don't have a car November recipe because I just started mm-hmm. yesterday. So this mm-hmm. is the last non carnivore thing that I made. Mm hmm. And um, the recipe comes originally from resolutioneats.com. It's mm-hmm. low-carb banana cream pie, but I modified it just a little bit. So I'll, I'll tell you what I did. So it's banana cream pie without bananas. So you're relying on banana flavoring. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not the greatest, yeah. but, you know, if you actually get that Jones for a bite of banana cream pie, it does the job. It'll do you. <laughs> All right. So the filling, here's what you need. A 13 and a half ounce can of full fat coconut cream. 
Now, I use coconut cream. This recipe calls for coconut milk. Yep. And uh, the cream just has fewer carbs in it, right? Mm-hmm. It's thicker. And more fat. And more fat, right. Three large egg yolks, a half a cup of sweetener, and uh, my sweetener du jour is allulose. Loving it, loving it. Mm-hmm. Yep. A teaspoon of xanthan gum, mm-hmm. a teaspoon of vanilla extract, a teaspoon of banana extract, and 12 ounces of cream cheese that it's been softened. 12 ounces mm-hmm. is one and a half packages of Philly cream cheese. Right. Just so you know. And optionally, you can use some yellow food coloring if you want it to look yellow. <laughs> it, it does look a little yellow from the egg yolks, but, you know, mm. not as yellow as banana would look. So for the topping, it's basically whipping cream, uh, two cups of whipping cream, but you're going to stiffen it up with gelatin. And so you basically melt an envelope of Knox or whatever, unflavored gelatin, mm-hmm. in a few teaspoons of, of water. Mm. And uh, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. You're also going to add a teaspoon of vanilla and three tablespoons of whatever sweetener du jour is, mm-hmm. you know, that's measured to sugar. Yeah. yeah. All right. For the crust, they say use cooking spray. I don't like cooking spray because usually it has flour in it. In Australia, you can get uh, um, coconut oil in a cooking spray. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. If you can find that, awesome. Um, You can also get these pumps that you can put any kind of oil in, avocado oil, oh, right. or whatever. Yep. And that's mm-hmm. what I use. So you want a half a cup of coconut flour, uh, a cup of super fine almond flour, a third of a cup of ground flaxseed meal. And this was mm-hmm. good. I actually used the flaxseed meal, and it's good because it gives it a little nutty flavor that I like. Now, the original mm-hmm. recipe calls for a third of a cup of unflavored or vanilla whey protein powder, mm. and I just uh, omitted that. Yeah. I added a little more almond flour. Mm-hmm. Two tablespoons of your favorite sweetener. An eighth of a teaspoon of salt. I added a little bit more because I like that salty crust yep. on, on a banana cream pie. It, it stands up nicely against the sweet. Mm-hmm. And a half a cup of melted butter, which is one stick. Mm-hmm. All right. So, I mean, pretty much if you ever cooked a pie, you know what to do here. But um, for the filling, first you separate the egg, uh, egg yolks. You beat the yolks a little bit. And heat the coconut milk in a little saucepan over medium heat. You want it to be hot but not boiling. So if it boils, take it off the heat and wait for a minute or two. And you're only going to take a quarter of the cup of that coconut cream and mix that into the eggs slowly to temper them. And then you add that to the rest of the coconut cream uh, and, mm-hmm. and you lower it, uh, lower the heat, so on low heat. And now you mix uh, the sweetener and the xanthan gum together in a small bowl and you sprinkle that over the coconut milk mixture, coconut cream. And mix that in. And you want to cook that for three or four minutes until it thickens up. Yeah, until it sets. Yep. Yep. Now you remove that from the heat and stir in the banana and vanilla extracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, you add that to a medium-sized bowl. So take it off the heat and cover it with plastic wrap. Or you can put it in a Tupperware and chill it in Mm -hmm. the fridge for at least two hours. That's really important. you got to chill it. It's got to be cold all the way through. So now, while that's chilling, you make the crust. So you preheat the oven to 350 Fahrenheit, and you put your cooking spray or whatever it is on the on a pie pan. And you mix the dry ingredients together, and you add in the melted butter, and you just mix it up with your hands, and uh, it crumbles. And now you just take that and press it into the pie pan with your fingers, mm-hmm. evenly distributed. And you want that to run up on the sides and around the little crimpy things. That's a... Uh, Technical term, crimpy things. <laughs> Technical term, chefy term. Yep. It's a very chefy <laughs> term, yeah. <laughs> and you want to dock it. So you take a fork and you poke some holes in the bottom of the crust. That just stops bubbles from appearing. Yeah, exactly. Now you only bake it for 10 minutes and that's enough to brown it around the edges. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go a little bit further, but you really don't want the crust to be so cooked that it just, you know, burns, right? You don't want it to, to really brown up. No, I've got these uh, little ceramic pie weights that are really good for, the, for yep. you know, keeping the pie down. You know, you just um, you, you crumple up some parchment paper, put it in the middle of the pie, and then put the weights on top of that, and that just keeps bubbles from appearing. And That's it also right. tends to, to stop the pie crust from burning, which is another thing. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, there isn't any baking powder in here, so it's not going to rise. Right. But, you, yeah, if you want to take some marbles or some ceramic uh, beads or anything like that and put them in the bottom, that's a classic technique for making pie crust. Uh-huh. Yep. 
All right, so now you're going to dissolve the gelatin. So what you do is you take a tablespoon of cold water in a small bowl and you sprinkle the gelatin on the top and you let that sit for two minutes and that sort of just softens the gelatin. And mm-hmm. then you stir in a tablespoon of boiling water and you stir it all until it's all dissolved. And mm-hmm. it's going to be kind of thick, you know, but that's mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now you use a mixer and you whip the heavy cream. We've talked about whipping cream before, but what I like to do is take a metal bowl and put it in the freezer for a minute or two. Yeah. And it gets it really cold. You need that. Mm-hmm. And then you uh, basically uh, bring it to soft peaks and you add in a teaspoon of vanilla extract, three tablespoons of sweetener. Mm-hmm. And then you slowly pour the gelatin mixture in and, you know, scrape it down. Right. And get all that stuff in there. Now you beat it up until it's stiff peaks, but yeah. not until it's butter. You don't want to do that. <laughs> no, you don't want butter. You, if you have butter, you got to start from scratch again. <laughs> yep. So now, in a large bowl, another bowl, you take the cream cheese and beat that until light and fluffy, and it should be softened. You know, it should be sitting out, uh, have been sitting out of the fridge for an hour or so. Sure. And now you slowly beat in the, the chilled pudding, the banana pudding, a little at a time. And if you want your food coloring, you put that in there afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, the whipped cream, you're going to take half of it and fold that into the cream cheese pudding mixture. And if you've ever Mm -hmm. folded egg whites, it's the same technique. You don't want to mix it. You don't want to stir it. You don't want to flatten the whipped cream. You want to just fold it over, turn, fold it over, turn. Yeah. And uh, now you basically put the filling into the cooled crust and the mm-hmm. remaining whipped cream goes on top, and you want to chill that in the fridge for at least three hours because you want the whole thing to set up. And, uh, right. man, it's, you know, if you haven't had banana cream pie in years like I haven't, it's it's a welcome taste. Yeah. i tell you what might be useful there is uh, doing it in muffin tins. Do like yeah. a dozen muffin tins and right. do little muffins, and then um, you know, just put a disc of the, of the crust on the bottom and then, yeah, so, uh, yeah, just to portion it into yep. smaller portions as well. So That's right. Nice. That sounds delicious. Um, it's a lot, sounds like a lot of hard work for a banana cream pie. It's a lot of work, but, you know, if you have family members who really yeah. want that, you know, sweet hey, experience. Thanksgiving's and, coming up. Yep. Yeah. You want to put a little bit of effort into Thanksgiving, people? Come on, seriously. Get at it. There you go. Oh, and by the way, Thanksgiving is coming up, and we have uh, – Um, a whole series of Thanksgiving recipes on our blog, which we'll put in the show notes. We did. Well, that's a show. Hey, thanks for listening. We hope you get as much out of this information as we do in putting it together. You know, Two Keto Dudes doesn't take ad revenue. We have no benefactors with hidden agendas. That's right. It's listeners like you who keep our lives on. There are a few ways you can support us, all of which are listed on our website, at donate.2keto.com. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time on 2 Keto Dudes. Dudes.